Well, hello to all our viewers of this series that is exploring the role of GIS in recovery systems. Uh, you have been uh, able to access a number of presentations uh, to uh, set the stage for this event, which is kind of a capstone of the things that uh, Amanda and Chris and I were talking about. Uh, we urge you, if you've not done so already, to reference those uh, videos, those uh, kind of webinars uh, when you get an opportunity. But right now, we're going to try and tie it all together. Um, as you may recall in my presentation, I emphasized the uh, role of GIS in all aspects of emergency uh, disaster response, uh, preparation, preparedness, mitigation, and recovery. This presentation focuses on recovery and the expanding role, the critical role that GIS, uh, both its practitioners and the systems themselves, play in developing recovery strategies and plans. Uh, we're going to use a kind of a seminar approach. So uh, our uh, previous panelists uh, are going to be answering questions that I pose, framing questions as they were, uh, as well as their own kind of reflections and ideas. We're also joined by uh, Paul Doherty, uh, who uh, is a long time uh, member of the NAPSIG uh, Foundation, uh, you know, critical staff. And, uh, and uh, we wanted to introduce him because he wasn't part of the previous webinar. So Paul, would you mind just telling us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are, and uh, or good evening, depending on when you're watching this. Uh, my name is Paul Doherty. I have, uh, as Clark mentioned, been a friend and member and even staff at times of NAPSIG over the past 10 years. My uh, real interest is in search and rescue and sort of early disaster response, but I've worked across a bunch of different sectors. Uh, spent some time in New Zealand uh, helping our emergency management agencies down there. And uh, just recently in October joined FEMA to help support their uh, geospatial game plan for urban search and rescue. So that's where I'm at today and hope to learn from all of you on this on this webinar. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for joining us. I, I think your uh, comments and your experience are going to be instrumental in trying to kind of identify those things uh, going forward that we can further utilize GIS for. I want to ask uh, to kind of kick this off uh, an opening question, uh, kind of traditional of, of seminar formats. Uh, I want to ask each of our, our uh, participants today, in your estimation, are we where we should be in the utilization of GIS? technology and the experience of GIS scientists and practitioners in the disaster response and recovery process, particularly in terms of recovery. Have we integrated GIS into these systems at a level that we should be? And what do you think the future should look like in terms of GIS technology and the overall comprehensive disaster response and recovery process? Uh, I'd like to start with uh, with Chris, uh, who brings a, a very important perspective uh, from the private sector and from the transportation system. Well, well thank you, Clark. Um, I think in the industry side, especially in the transportation industry side, we are just scratching the surface of GIS. You know, five years ago, when I took the role of director of hazardous materials and dealing with emergency management on more of a um, corporate level, GIS was three initials that we just kind of heard about in the background. And as we have progressed over the years in the technology of positive train control, um, digging more into emergency management as a as a global um, as a global effort uh, mm -hmm. in our industry, you know, CSX operates over twenty three states. So when we're doing disaster recovery, we're not just looking at one particular location, one county. We're having to look over multiple states. And this is where GIS has truly helped us progress that effort and become more efficient and effective in our recovery. Yeah. So the future looks bright, uh, and uh, uh, but it's going to take some will. It's going to take some um, decision making by leadership to integrate further where we need to be, both private sector and uh, in particular GIS. Is that a fair thing to say? Absolutely. And I think our, our executives are seeing the absolute um, you know, positive items that come out of the GIS pre-planning. 
you know, we're using LIDAR right now uh, to, to map out all of our tracks. So now we're looking at elevation. So now we can start pre-planning for flood issues and, mm-hmm. you know, hurricanes that are, are coming up the East Coast. We can start staging equipment, staging materials because of the use of GIS and all of the mapping that we've done. Now we know where our hotspots are going to be before they become a hotspot. Yeah, that's great. Amanda, what are your thoughts? <laughs> um, actually, just piggybacking on what Chris was just talking about, I think we're we're entering into an era where regions are starting to act more and think more strategically. And that's what GIS brings. Um, it's that ability to look at the regional perspective of where your infrastructure is, where your people are, what are the conditions within the population groups and the infrastructure of your region. And then, you know, what imagery is, I come from an aerial imagery company, near map. What, uh, what imagery brings to the table is that current look at the current conditions so that when disaster strikes, you know exactly where everything is, what condition it is in today. And then you can start to think strategically about how are we going to manage the situation of the recovery effort not just on day one or day two, but also day 10, day 30, day 60, day 90. And so every part of the population is back to where, at least back to where they started or stronger. Yeah. I hear you saying something really important, and and uh, I, I think it's going to permeate our conversation today, which is we should be doing this work in times of calm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, in your presentation, you demonstrated incredible capabilities of near map. Now we're going to show you a, a, a video to tee up our first conversation of a natural disaster uh, in uh, Cedar Rapids based on a historical event. Uh, but I mean, I think the simple question is, what would the world be looking like uh, in terms of our efficacy if we started planning for the possibility of a hazardous incident, a devastating tornado in Cedar Rapids six months before it actually touched down? Mm-hmm. Well, Paul, uh, how about you? What do you think? Yeah, I think from my perspective, looking at the nation and even uh, many other countries, it's all about practice. And I think, unfortunately, there are a lot of local governments that have been hit by several repeated disasters, and they've got a great recovery geospatial game plan. I worry more about the counties that have been lucky and skirted disasters in the past 10 years that are not prepared. And I think that uh, they might be investing in their geospatial and other elements of local government or state government, but um, may not have a game plan in place ready for that big disaster that's going to go beyond an initial response and into recovery. But if we looked at the country as a whole, as a mosaic, we could make an all-star team for recovery. I just think that it's the uh, it's the repeat repeated disaster locations that have the most practice, unfortunately. Right. If we could exercise into recovery a bit longer rather than uh, a bit more often rather than just as an afterthought to response. I think our collective geospatial, you know, game plan for recovery would be a lot more mature as a, as a nation. So yeah. that's my perspective. And, and we know from experience that uh, the response phase of a disaster could take, you know, a week, maybe a, maybe a month, depending on the nature of the disaster. Recovery can go on for years and, because it's, ultimately more complex. Putting the pieces back together uh, is a huge endeavor. And of course, a goal of recovery is to put them back better than the way you found them, uh, if possible. Now, there's a lot of impingements and constraints on that. But I know that's the role of FEMA, the experience they have, obviously profound over the years. You also bring up a great point. There are many places in this country that are preparing for potential disasters according to their hazards, but they don't necessarily have, they have not necessarily exercised them, you know, and that's probably a good problem, right? You know, it means they haven't been squashed by a horrible incident. Well, I'd like to now set the stage for our in-depth conversation about the role of GIS in recovery by, uh, by giving you a, a, a very short kind of scenario. Now, I want to, uh, preface this uh, by saying we're going to do two scenarios. We're going to do one that's, you know, natural, one that's potentially intentional, uh, kind of getting in in the realm of more of a terrorist sort of of, uh, situation. But uh, where we want to kind of frame this conversation is as if we were considering or in the middle of a planning 
process around the recovery uh, uh, table. You know, I've been a recovery manager manager before. My uh, my, uh, as you may have already heard, uh, I'm, I had a career in the Seattle Police Department, but I was also the EOC director for about seven years. We had a number of of uh, uh, recovery efforts that flowed out of, of that. My uh, orientation has always been, I need everybody at the table that is going to help create the best form of a recovery effort. And I've maintained for a long time that GIS is at the top of that list. So let's uh, start our conversation by playing this quick video. It's um, again, based on a historical incident. And, uh, and that's where we're gonna kind of proceed with the natural disaster role of GIS in a recovery effort. Forty persons are confirmed dead and at least 900 injured as we begin to get a more complete picture of the devastation caused by that deadly EF5 Cedar Rapids tornado. Michael Iella has the latest for us. Michael. Gary, the path of destruction was almost 16 miles long. The tornado touched down near Fairfax and moved in an erratic northeastern direction before slicing through downtown. Now, approximately 6,000 residents are displaced, including individuals with special needs. Interstate 380 is closed for three miles in both directions from the bend at First Avenue. The First and Second Avenue bridges are unusable, and city roads have tons of debris that need to be cleared. City Hall and police headquarters have been vacated due to structural issues, and the seriously damaged Mercy Medical Center has been relocating patients to other medical facilities. And finally, Cedar Rapids firefighters are making progress in extinguishing the last of the fires, but their efforts remain hampered by extensive power outages and low water pressure. Gary? All right, Michael, thank you. Social media is revealing a stream of fear and hopelessness by residents who face so much devastation. One downtown store owner who lost everything said, quote, I love my city, but I can't see how we will ever be the same. We're going now to Pat Alverson, who's standing by for a briefing. Well, I, I say this uh, with a great deal of, of, uh, of heaviness in my heart, but uh, this is a very timely scenario when you look at even today, uh, uh, what's going on among, in five states in the South, uh, six people dead, there's 10 million under either tornado watch or warning, the devastation uh, is just immense and as, as is the human suffering. So this is a good conversation for us to dive into because what's at stake here uh, are our brothers and sisters and, uh, and their, their ability to return to a life that they recognize. I'd like to just start by bridging uh, a little bit uh, the worlds of response and recovery. Um, obviously at the cornerstone of response is the restoration of essential services and functions, got to get the debris out of the way, you got to open up supply lines, uh, you, you've got a lot of different things to do, and, they, and they're arranged uh, in an order of criticality. Obviously, the uh, taking down of a hospital or an emergency medical system uh, becomes incredibly uh, uh, significant in terms of starting to recover. Uh, I'd like to ask each of you uh, how you kind of size up uh, the, uh, the priorities and what GIS can bring to this whole array of things, it's a very broad question, whole array of things that we've identified as being uh, challenged that we have to recover from. Uh, Paul, do you wanna take the first stab at that? Yeah, as I was watching the video, I took some notes there and I counted about one, two, three, four, five, about, about 10 different pieces of essential information that uh, having a map and, and some sort of analysis to understand the beyond the factoids, beyond the 6,000 people, the, the where of the problem would be really helpful. And I think in the initial phases, there might be a lot of tactical needs that GIS can satisfy. Just, you know, where are those 6,000 people's homes? That's gonna help us project into recovery. Um, I think there's definitely some strategic and operational uh, questions that can be answered using GIS, but I'd rather uh, turn it over to our, our other uh, colleagues here. Sure, oh, well, Amanda, you, you provide the the uh, the bird's eye view, uh, as it were. But I also want to 
you know, explore with, with each of you what we can do, uh, I don't know, predictively or analytically uh, in terms of uh, dealing with that priority list of things that have to be done in response, but then more to the point, setting us up for the role of GIS in recovery. Mm -hmm. And so I guess um, to that point, I would start with when you're when you're engaging in predictive modeling, predictive modeling is taking um, a number of different pieces of data and pulling all of that information together um, to model for what might happen in the past. And so that's what we do in geospatial predictive modeling. And one, one thing from the aerial perspective that we can provide, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, aerial providers like NearMap, but specifically NearMap, um, I'll be honest, are on top of the currency that we offer and continually collecting every, you know, every populated region of 55,000 and above up to three times a year in the United States. We're also collecting artificial, artificially intelligence derived data. And so we actually are creating data that is now can be updated up to three times a year. So that when you're starting your predictive modeling, you're starting with the knowledge of where every single house is for each of the 6,000 residents. Um, especially in regions of high rates of growth, it's imperative that you start with the latest and most current data because the data that goes into your predictive model determines the level of quality of the data on the output of your predictive model. And so when you're running, managing things like risk assessment, you want to start with good data. And so you want to start with high resolution for flood modeling. If you want to model, you know, if this is a long, you know, if this is a 100 year flood, it's not going to go away in one day. And so how long will it take it to recede and who's going to be affected along that timeline? And so having that data, having a high resolution digital terrain model and having current and accurate, you know, building footprint, not just building footprint data, but building footprint data that's enriched with actually height and elevation data and story counts. So you know where your people are within these residences, especially when you think in terms of multi-unit dwellings that can actually go quite high. Um, being equipped with, yeah, just data that's current, accurate and complete is going to create and help you to create the models that's gonna allow you to know where's my highest risk of vulnerable population in a flood, um, a wind event, or wildfire, or any situation. So you're describing a system that, you know, in, in my uh, um, woefully inadequate IT capability viewpoint is kind of before and after. I mean, having, having the data and the visuals and everything else, mm -hmm. what, if you, what if you don't? I mean, is, is mm -hmm. Is that, a good, is that a problem around the country where you, you have, depending on the jurisdiction, you're coming in cold and the only real visuals you have are the ones you're taking after the disaster? Mm. Yeah, no, it's a great point. When you're coming in, if you're coming in cold with no data, no prior knowledge except for you know your existing understanding of your common operating picture, um, it's going to be the aerial flights that are going to tell you the current condition. And so the area, so in I, you know, I do propose aerial over satellite because you need the resolution. You need that ability to zoom in and see the risk on the ground. Um, and so with, yeah, with aerial activity post disaster, you're going to get the picture of what the ground looks like today. So you can start to map the ingress and egress routes, depending on the level of severity. So let's just assume we're, you know, we have that EF5 tornado like in Cedar Rapids. Um, you have to know how am I gonna get people out of the residences in, you know, to triage locations or to the hospital. And if I have to get a helicopter in and out, where am I gonna land it? Um, and so this is where 3D um, data actually comes into play. But where are my helicopter landing zones? Where's the land flat enough for me to land a chopper to get as many people to safety and to um, adequate health care as possible? Yeah, thank you. That's, that's, that's very, very helpful. How, how fast can you get aerial imagery? I mean, so if NearMap is, is mobilized, uh, what's the... Uh, yeah. Tell me a little bit about the mechanics of that, and and. Uh... Mm -hmm. Well, I don't. I, this is where I'll nerd out a little bit because this is one of the fantastic things about NearMap as a company. What we've done is we've created our own proprietary sensors, and so our sensors are manufactured to capture at large scales at high elevations, so we can capture regionally, so we can achieve that repeat revisit where it's needed most. Um, 
amongst our populations. And so what we do, and just some of the mechanics of an aerial platform is, it's not like a satellite platform where you have a sweeping sensor that's just collecting data. What we do is we're collecting individual images, just almost like if you can imagine and envision taking your cell phone camera and just taking individual pictures of the ground beneath you. You're going to get stacks, overlapping layers of pictures that you then have to stitch together to form meaningful information. So for a lot of companies, I say all that to say that takes time. And one of the things that we've engineered is a way to accurately and consistently truncate that timeline so that we can collect a region um, quickly and have it up in the to, at the fingertips of our customers through our platform and APIs within a day. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. So Chris, um, you can get us into the, uh, the inner workings of CSX. This has just happened as depicted. Uh, and, uh, you know, with any uh, any luck, you've already been working with jurisdictions on at least the rail role, role the railway role in mm -hmm. terms of these partnerships and response and ultimately recovery. But yeah, give us a thought on, on how you're envisioning um, how you would be dealing with this kind of priority by priority um, and, and in your own experience, I'm sure is pretty profound. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, we're seeing the storms moving through our our territory right now, and we've had several problems with uh, tornadoes here in the recent past, especially in, in Alabama, Mississippi areas. You know, a lot of it starts with pre-planning and having those open discussions with all of the departments that can be affected uh, during a, during an incident of this magnitude, and, and and making sure you know in industry we see a lot of silos be built within a company. And it's making sure you break down those silos, but mm -hmm. making sure that the operations group and, and the recovery group are all asking the same and the right questions, and they know what questions to ask. Um, and and that, that comes into having those conversations well before you have an incident happen. Um, you know, one of the things that we saw you know, 10 years ago uh, during some of the major incidents that we, we encountered and, and had to manage, it, a lot of folks didn't understand what the emergency management folks have to deal with and what we have to plan for and and then being able to move into that recovery and so it is absolutely critical that you have those conversations well before you have an incident occur um you know, for us you know we have and we're very unique uh, we have a lot of managers throughout our, our company that are drone operators so being able to get drone footage very quickly is is over the past three years has really boosted our ability to be able to recover very quickly. Um, and, and, and the other thing that we, we like to do is you know, when we're dealing with a community, we like to understand what are some of their issues that they're going to have during an incident. Uh, we've noticed that during uh, when we had Mount Carb in uh, West Virginia, a, a large scale derailment there. You know, one of the things that we noticed for that community is you know, they can't recover very quickly and go out and, and get a hotel room on their own. So we ended up developing a standard of care for these communities and having those conversations well before an incident happened is, you know, how can we, do we understand, you know, the economics of a community? Do we understand, you know, their restrictions um, and how they can manage internally as an emergency management agency, you know, their community and what assets and resources can we bring to them and, and we, we begin those conversations well before we have an incident. You know, we look at our, our key routes and where we move a lot of hazardous products. And we start doing that pre-planning with a lot of those communities well before we have an incident happen. So, you know, it, it all begins with having those critical conversations with all of the players, not just the emergency management folks, but the industries in those communities, you know, the 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 uh, you know schools and hospitals and those you know those folks to understand you know how would how would they react and what assets and resources would they need if their facility became uninhabitable? Yes. And what can CI, CI, uh, CSX bring to the table in terms of GIS assets as a part of this uh, so, overall approach? Right. So we've done extensive mapping of our territories. Um, and, and understanding, just like Amanda was was speaking of, you know, understanding elevations, understanding, you know, in, in times of flooding, 
you know, where are we going to see issues of, you know, culverts that back up and end up flooding into homes, um, water treatment intakes and, and power, power plants. We have a lot of lines, uh, power lines, communication lines that run along our right of way. And if those become damaged, you know, how does that affect the communities on both sides of those communication lines? And so understanding all of that and having that in the pre-planning becomes absolutely critical to when having a timely recovery uh, moving forward after you have an incident. I gather that you're immediately ready to partner, uh, as well as, of course, look after the priorities of CSX and the restoration of the, of the system. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there, there is, you can't succeed without having those partnerships. And it's critical that we build those partnerships before we have a natural disaster or a man-made disaster. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put on my uh, uh, recovery um, um, manager hat here, which again, I've, I've had to wear a number of times. And one of the probably top questions as we are undertaking in a recovery analysis and, and ultimately identifying uh, requirements and priorities is to uh, to identify interdependencies, to know uh, as best we can what the failure of one system or location means in terms of other systems and locations. Mm -hmm. Those interdependencies uh, also uh, considered, you know, the analysis of cascading effects really create the the most accurate map of what needs to be done when. Um, how does, uh, in your view, GIS provide uh, the data, uh, the, uh, the, the analytical process to assist in identifying, you know, uh, say, look at Cedar Rapids, identifying what's connected to what, what uh, the first point of failure is, what we need to fix first if we want to make sure that there aren't downstream uh, challenges. Um, We'll go to uh, uh, Amanda on that. Mm -hmm. So in terms of downstream challenges and where do we start and what do we fix first, I think, you know, just from a just, I guess, from a general perspective, really, you want to look at, you know, assess the situation as it is today. And so and that means you have to get a you have to get current, accurate and complete data as quickly as possible. And so sometimes some users will actually use a drone program um, and actually fly the region. But if you're if the level of severity of the disaster is higher and more regional, then you got to elevate to an aerial platform. And so the sooner you can get that data, you can actually start to pinpoint the areas of highest distress. And once you see the areas of highest distress, that's when you do start to map, you know, what's that downstream effect? So how many of our grocery stores were destroyed during the disaster? And what's the downstream effect to the local community? Where are the food deserts going to be within my region? How many has hospitals, you know, or, you know, heaven forbid, but, you know, nursing care facilities, how many of those were affected and how are we gonna treat these people moving forward? And by knowing that information early on, you can, you know, just to min much of the conversation we've already had, you can start to mitigate the downstream effects because you can start to plan if something were to happen to this facility, where am I going to move these people? If I can't get them to another facility, where would I put that triage tent? And what's the most hospitable place to, you know, to start triage planning if needed? And the same thing with food resources. If we were to lose, you know, resource or food resources, so grocery stores, you know, A, B, C, and D, where are those resources going to come to, uh, to support these populations? And you can start partnering and planning ahead of time with other local communities to say, hey, we want to be ready for the next time that this happens. We partner with us and make sure that our population, you know, it, it rebounds, recovers, and comes back stronger than, than before. Yes, very well said. Uh, Paul, you know, we use the classic example, and it's probably the, the simplest one of the effects of interdependent systems. You know, when we look at, well, the power goes out, so you can't pump fuel, you don't have gas, et cetera. I mean, and, and it kind of descends from there. But how do you size up the, the way that GIS can contribute to that analysis with a view toward ultimately setting priorities and requirements? Yeah, I would... 
I like to think of our uh, ability to plan in terms of a timeline. So from the from the forecasted event, if we have that privilege, or if it's a no notice event, all the way out to recovery, you should be thinking about how the information systems fit together, right? You've got your base data, what you know now. So a lot of what Amanda has been talking about is where are our critical facilities? You have to know that, right? But I think knowing how you're going to assess the situation throughout the event, you might start with what people have in their pockets, right? So using mobile platforms to get an initial scene size up, moving into drone or aerial platforms, all the way out into recovery where now the information needs are so complex, right? And in mm -hmm. theory, we have more time, but actually we don't. We need to uh, work in recovery as quickly as we do in response. And I think it's having that plan built in, thinking about the, the facilities that re rely on each other. You have to know where they are first, and then you have to know how they fit together. So I think location plays a really critical role. And then, uh, you know, I think Amanda and Chris both alluded to, you know, what about the populations? What do they rely on? And knowing where the most vulnerable people uh, live, um, where they work, is just as important as the facilities that support them. And I think there's a whole session at uh, this event about vulnerable populations, if I remember correctly. And um, and just putting a shameless plug in, uh, we also have an event where we're going to talk about using mobile platforms on the ground with first responders. But remember, these are just pieces of the puzzle. You need to have a comprehensive plan. And I think um, that's what everybody's trying to get to today. Yes. And and again, my emphasis has been that, you know, having the, the largest array of experience and the tools uh, to meet objectives around that recovery planning table and ultimately out in the field uh, is uh, a recovery manager's dream. And it, I'm, I'm saying it's a dream for a reason because it's often aspirational and not real. Uh, but I think we want to get closer and closer to that. Um, I'm glad you asked about the issue of of the vulnerable populations. There's a whole lot of layers to, to that. I mean, I think it's embedded in, a, in the largest and most important construct in our society, which is social justice, it's equity. Um, and uh, I'd like all of you to, to kind of give your thoughts about how uh, GIS can contribute to understanding requirements with a view toward uh, the most vulnerable uh, needs, the, the, the needs of the most vulnerable, um, Amanda used the term food deserts, uh, which I think is a really important concept. I mean, are we are we going to be restoring um, service to an area that has inadequate service before the the storm? I mean, that that's a that's a real big issue in many many parts of the country. So, um, Chris, let's go back back to you. I mean, from that private sector partnership perspective, uh, and and in in particular. The role of uh, the railways in supply chain um, uh, issues and, and objectives. I mean, how do you how do you integrate for yourself the role of GIS into again the analysis, the recovery requirement process in terms of restoring equity as a top priority? Right, and so we've seen we've seen this in several of our large scale incidents where we we pulled in census data. Um, We've, we've utilized, you know, it, it, it's, it's tough to, to pull it in on a GIS level for us, but working with the emergency management agencies and, and getting their information um, that they have pulled over, you know, years of being in that community and managing incidents in that community to help, we, we have them help guide us into where these vulnerable populations are that may be impacted. And then as a, as a private industry, it then becomes you know, upon us to ensure that those particular um, you know, citizens that are impacted by an incident that either we've created or a natural incident that we may be involved in and, and making sure that we do everything that we possibly can do to make that critical time during an incident as comfortable as possible. And that goes every, that goes all the way down to going to people's homes and getting their medication for them because they get, they were evacuated so quickly they couldn't take their medication. Um, feeding their pets and making sure their pets are taken care of or removing them and reuniting them 
uh, with the owners. You know, those are things that, you know, a lot of people don't think industry would, would ever do. Uh, you know, I'm very fortunate that with CSX, we, we put a very high priority on ensuring that the community is taken care of when they're involved in an incident. And so, you know, this, again, those are conversations that we have three to four times a year with upper management throughout our company and the leadership in our company that, you know, you need to understand that these are things that we're going to focus on, not just getting the, the, the infrastructure put back together, but making sure that the community is put back together and we, we try not to interrupt their lives, uh, you know, as, as long or as short a period as we can, you know, just make it as quick as possible, get them back into their homes, um, you know, and not, it is kind of funny because I, I come back to Mount Carbon, which had sub-zero temperatures, and, and we ended up pre-planning saying we knew we were going to have water pipes break. So we ended up calling in companies from all over the region to be prepared to be on standby, to be able, when, when heat came back on and they found that pipes were broken, we're going to go into those homes and we're going to make sure they're taken care of. And those are things that industry can do, you know, to ensure that communities, that emergency managers don't have to think about that. It's being taken care of. The emergency management agency has so much that they have to worry about in a community. You know, we look at what can industry do that's involved with that, that can take some of that weight off of that emergency manager and off of that community so that they can get back to focusing on that long-term recovery. Because, you know, we see it all the time where, the endurance level for long-term recovery is is hard to maintain. And so whatever we can do to help with that recovery process and, and take those things that drain that energy for that recovery away from an emergency manager or, or a community, that's what we, we try and do as a, as a um, corporate citizen. Great. Paul, any thoughts uh, from you on, on this very large issue of bringing equity into the equation of planning for free. Yeah, I think, um, you know, Chris raised a good point of, of, you know, you can look at data or data and uh, there are lots of sources out there that are derived from census or even private sector data. Uh, a go-to that's openly available is the social vulnerability index from the CDC. And that gives you a bird, bird's eye view. So you might think of that as like the satellite imagery, right? It gives you an understanding of where people live um, but one of the things I learned in, in New Zealand especially is you also can go out and ask people if they're vulnerable, right? You, you, you can make assumptions from the pre-existing data, but you need to be able to size that up. And I'm seeing geospatial and crowdsourcing and, and getting volunteers out on the streets to actually talk to people is playing a much more uh, critical role in understanding vulnerability in our communities. The biggest challenge, of course, is maintaining their privacy at the same time. But I right. think that um, we are seeing a big shift in in how we look at vulnerability and not just looking at the number of structures damaged, but the number of people in a community and who they are. And and uh, like I said, going from the, the bird's eye view down to the streets is, is really important. Yes. I mean, we are ultimately constructing kind of a battle plan, right? And so what are the elements uh, of of that endeavor uh, and, and community uh, aspirations and the realities, the social realities of where people live and how they're impacted by disaster. Uh, and that seems to me at the very top of the list of the criteria that we need to apply. I, I remember we were having a, actually it was a tabletop. It wasn't a real uh, response and recovery to a disaster, but uh, we were all making these big plans and identifying uh, the array of things that need to be done and the order they need to be done. And, and one of our more uh, seasoned uh, uh, veterans of these uh, uh, endeavors said, you know, we're all making up uh, a list of things we're going to do for or maybe to the community. We haven't even asked them what they think is important. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, was, that was one of those aha moments. That, uh, <laughs> but integrating that could be, you know, it's, it's tough to get community priorities in the middle or after a disaster. I mean, a lot of times, because you're dealing with uh, a higher you know, level of essential restoration, but we want to restore in a way that, again, leaves the place better than the way we found it. Amanda, yeah. your thoughts? Yeah, um, you know, it's just interesting. Just listening to Paul, I was just thinking that about that combination between the truth from above and the conversations on the ground and actually being able to link, you know, 
where is that destructed, I, you know, the building that was destroyed on day one. And obviously we were gonna, we wanna get to and serve that population. But what about the buildings that are still destroyed as of day 30, 60, 90, one and one to two years out? And the thing, the, you know, the benefit that imaging brings, I think is the burden of proof as we move and during that, I guess, along that timeline to make sure that the people that we're talking to, that we're linking them to the actual situation on the ground, and that when they're saying that they're struggling, that we have the documentation at hand that says, yes, this population, the budget, you know, needs to, we need to actually plan our budget to extend to these longer reaches of time to make sure that every person is taken care of with any funding that, you know, any region receives for a disaster. But having that, having that visual along that timeline is what's going to be imperative to make sure that you can marry, you know, the voices to the truth. Yes, great. Well said. I like that. I'm going to put that on uh, on my bumper stickers. Uh, that uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll I'll give you attribution too. Well, this has been. Uh, uh, an important conversation, you know, particularly as I reflect back on my own uh, experiences trying to kind of, uh, you know, kind of shepherd a recovery effort. I mean, the information that GIS can provide, I've always believed is absolutely instrumental and not based on a task orientation, but as a full participant. Uh, I'd like to uh, hear from Paul Doherty. He's actually got uh, some real, real world work to do. Uh, his kind of concluding thoughts on this uh, first section of our our roundtable. Yeah, I would say um, you could probably tally the number of times I said plan or game plan um, in the few times I talked, but I can't emphasize enough that you can start today with just a whiteboard, right, and snap a photo of it and say, if something happened tomorrow, this is how I think we do scene size up. This is how I think we do follow up. This is how we'd move into recovery. And these are the information systems we need. Getting that down on a whiteboard today is a really great idea. And then bringing people to the table and formalizing the process and making sure that's institutionalized. Um, GIS is just an information system. It's, it's your knowledge of your community, large or small, that's gonna help you get through. But you wanna make sure the information system's always ready to go to answer your most critical questions. And I think if you can, Start small, but think big. I think uh, you'll be a lot more successful, whether you're private sector or, or in government or even your own home. So that would be uh, my parting words. We actually had some real world uh, tornadoes yesterday and I'm not personally impacted, but might have to attend to some, some work matters. So appreciate uh, the early exit. Yes, well, you've got, uh, got a lot of work to do and uh, I really appreciate your participation in, in this first part of our uh, round table, uh, but more I appreciate your dedication and in service to the communities. Your, your work with uh, NAPSIG has and continues to be uh, absolutely vital. And uh, I am glad to see you're part of the FEMA team. So thanks very much and, and uh, Godspeed in your next endeavor. All right, thanks a lot, everybody. Yeah. So let's, um, let's now look at a different kind of scenario, disaster scenario, one that has layers of complexity that uh, that from um, my role uh, in the Center for Homeland Defense and Security at the Naval Postgraduate School, uh, where I'm a facilitator in SME, uh, is probably on the top of public safety uh, professionals' minds, which is an intentional act. You know, uh, a natural disaster has its own complexities and devastation. An intentional act, uh, which creates a disaster, has an additional uh, component, which is that it is authored by a malignant brain that can continue to inflict damage, uh, that uh, is using you know, some kind of rat rational versus a, a brute force set of motives uh, to uh, wreak havoc. So uh, this is a notional scenario. This didn't really happen. Uh, I, I don't think it involved the CSX uh, system, um, at least I'm hoping it didn't, at least in our original scenario. Um, but it, uh, it occurred in the uh, region of Fort Bend County in Texas, uh, and, uh, and it's probably one of the scenarios which uh, Chris knows very well.
to go. Two tank cars carrying 59,000 gallons of Bakken crude derailed in Richmond under suspicious circumstances and exploded. The numbers are grim. 12 people are dead, 350 injured, and thousands now suffer from respiratory issues. Hundreds of people remain displaced or homeless, and major roads are closed all around the explosion site. It took firefighters 28 hours to extinguish the blaze, but recovery can take years. The town of Lac Meganic in Quebec is still struggling after a runaway oil train exploded in the center of their town, killing 47. That was over four years ago. Now, it's our turn. How do we make sense of the loss of life and livelihood and repair our community's psychological health? What is the plan for restoring critical infrastructure and regaining economic stability? How do we get people back in their homes while supporting our most vulnerable populations? And oil processing operations have been significantly curtailed, sparking fears of oil shortages. These are local, regional, and national questions, but it all starts here with the government and community leaders of Fort Benning County. In the scenario we presented, uh, this is about two or three years ago, we introduced, uh, or it was an inject, that immediately prior to the derailment, witnesses saw an explosion on the tracks, uh, which obviously suggests very strongly that uh, this was an intentional act. Um, so that puts it in a bit of a different perspective. But I, you know, again, the devastation is, is uh, clearly the highest uh, priority. Uh, the prospect that there may be uh, malicious actors still at large, of course, is of great concern to the community and to law enforcement. Well, let me start with Chris. Uh, you've probably been thinking and experiencing this kind of scenario a lot in your career. Just walk us through the first kind of uh, thought processes in terms of, of the role of CSX, particularly as we move into recovery from uh, a devastating incident of this kind. Right. So now you start bringing in several different agencies um, into a scenario of this nature. And so we, begin, we, we fall into the incident command system um, and into the NIMS process and start working with local law enforcement, federal law enforcement, in order to make sure, one, we preserve all of the evidence um, that may be there on site. And then we start looking at the rest of our, our security plan. You know, all railroads have a security plan, um, especially around the movement of hazardous materials. And you know, we're very fortunate, uh, just like most class one, all class one railroads, we have our own police department um, that works with you know local agencies on a, on a regular basis. So, you know, part of this is the pre-planning side of it, having a good security plan, pushing that security plan out to your to your employees. But in an incident like this, now we're being folded into a full unified command and we're having to work with you know, all, all types of agencies with all types of acronyms in order to ensure that, you know, one, we can manage the incident, you know, when you're dealing with fire and evacuations and things of that nature. And then next, you have to also be thinking about um, evidence preservation for the investigation. So, so, so really, it becomes a very complex situation to deal with all of those agencies and manage the incident at the same time. And you know, we've done very well with that with some of the other incidents that we've encountered um, with people placing things on the track. Um, one of the unique things that industry has done is called positive train control, PTC. And you'll see that in our presentation a little bit about PTC. Um, but basically if, if we have an interruption in that track circuit, it forces our trains to stop on areas where we operate hazardous materials. So depending on when this particular issue happened, we, a lot of times we may be able to prevent some of these issues from occurring. Yes, there may be damage to the track, but our trains can stop well in advance of that issue. Um, but again, you know, we do a lot of tabletop exercises with a lot of these investigor investigation um, agencies. And that helps build foster that relationship so that they understand what we need to do and we understand what they need to do in order to, to facilitate a, a solid um, investigation and recovery of the incident. This is a 
very large footprint, ultimately, when you think about the long-term effects. You've got environmental hazards. You've obviously got the impacts to the transportation, the rail transportation system, uh, it, it, probably on a national or even, you know, international, at least Canadian, U.S. kind of basis. I mean, when a train system shuts down, it's re it reverberates throughout the country, as I understand it. Uh, again, a kind of a long vision sort of, of approach. I mean, how do you, uh, as C in CSX, um, maybe through utilization of GIS, um, you know, kind of map out the various steps that need to be taken? I mean, you've got rail security, you've got restoration of the rail lines, you've got, uh, well, get back to that community issue again. You've got people that are very, very frightened, you know, if, if uh, the belief or the evidence shows that this was intentional. What's the what's the long range view uh, in terms of CSX and a crisis of this kind? So the long range view would be prevention, you know, absolute prevention. And and we have over the past 15 years, we through GIS and through some of the other technology that we've been able to employ, we've been able to do a lot of identify our strategic infrastructure points and we're able to install monitoring systems there. Um, we've, we've installed um, throughout the company processes and procedures, uh, one, to prevent this, these type of things, and two, in the response side of it. And it's, it's, it's a learn, constant learning evolution. Um, you, you just can't rely on, yes, I've got this book with all of these great instructions and processes and procedures, but if nobody's reading that book, if nobody's going back through and adjusting any issues, problems, editing, um, and then education, um, educating all of the new employees that we have coming on board. And, and that is a daily process um, is education of, of, of one, what, what do they need to be looking for and planning for in their own territories and their own terminals, but also, you know, on a company wide um, issue, you know, supply chains, things of that nature. What do we need to do to ensure that those supply chains stay open? Um, you know, rail is kind of a, a unique uh, infrastructure where it's basically one way in, one way out. You know, we can't take a right hand turn, a left hand turn. Otherwise, you start looking at, uh, you know, large disruption within the system. So, um, you know, in an instant like this, it may take several days to several weeks before the investigation is fully complete. And we've restored that one particular line. And that's where now we have to get with partnerships with other railroads to be able to, to move that merchandise to keep the economy uh, moving in, in a forward direction. So, but you know, in an incident like this, yes, you had that one small incident, but that will put shockwaves throughout the industry because now your security threat levels are moving up. Now employees are doing different things in their terminals and having to, through the process, in order to protect that that terminal and that asset and that, re, and that resource, and then, you know, moving along the line of line of what we call line of road between one terminal and another terminal, what do we need to do to protect you know those areas as we do our normal day to day operations of track inspection, infrastructure protection, and, and inspection, and and then you know what what kind of education do we need to teach our employees to further help them be able to identify where they may see something that doesn't look right. So it's kind of one of those things of. You know, recognize, record, and report are three R's in our company. You have to recognize when you have something that doesn't look right, then you have to, you know, report it and record it. So that that's where you know our education process is continuously evolving, and our GIS comes into play with marking our critical infrastructure and then monitoring that critical infrastructure. Yes. Yeah. So Amanda, your team gets the call and this is what you're handed. Uh, we can make an assumption that you've done previous work in this area. So you've got some kind of baseline uh, before and after picture. But um, what do you bring to the table, particularly given this, I don't know, somewhat unique and, and uh, the suggestion of nefarious sort of origin for, um, for this uh, disaster? Mm -hmm. And I think we bring, I guess, two aspects. There's one, one is just, you know, dealing with the current situation and the nefarious character. You know, we, like, it depends on, you know, what we're contracted to fly, because if, for a recovery effort, 
you know, the if the locations in a region that we're imaging three times a year, every every one of our customers will get that three times a year shot. That's just part of a subscription with Nearmap. But if we increase that cadence, um, you know, we would talk about actually mapping the recovery effort in an efficient way to utilize whatever budget was allocated to get these people back up on their feet. And so when you think about the information that would come from a strategic cadence of imagery over time and how you align that kind of to a previous point I made to the funding that you're given to make sure that, you know, you are reaching every person, but also, I guess, every point of in infrastructure. So every, every residence and every point of critical infrastructure and prioritizing the funding in a way that efficiently uses budget and efficiently gets everything back on its feet. And we can time our flights to actually monitor that effort and make sure that every, every part of this process and every part of every project associated is staying on track and on time. And then the other piece that, you know, that we can bring to the table is just that um, the better understanding of that common operating picture at the incident. And so working with public safety officials, we and I have done this in, in, in my past imaging world has worked with public safety officials to help them to map out that common operating picture at the time of the incident. So when we get that flame up at, right after the incidents occurred, we can actually show the extent of the damage and we can show, you know, the pattern of life at the time of the event and hopefully right prior to the event if we have collected it frequently. Um, and the other thing I would say the imaging community at large can bring is actually, you know, and I wouldn't have said this 10 years ago, but we're actually, it's funny, they, um, we say that with the launch of the Iconos satellite, we entered the age of transparency. But since Iconos was launched, I mean, we, gosh, we, it's more than tenfold, we're growing satellites more than tenfold every year. Um, we're not launching satellites anymore, we're launching constellations of satellites. And so I can't promise that we will have the image of the character, but I can state that if, you know, if you work with your satellite providers around the globe, um, somebody very well could have caught an image that would actually help in the investigation of this case. Um, just with the adventation of things like small sats. So if you're mapping a big truck, a small, a small satellite can actually see a massive trucker or a mess, sorry, a, a massive truck. Um, but, and they, they have the ability to image multiple times a day. And so, and then you have big sats that have a higher resolution offering that could have caught it as well. And they're, like I said, the commercial industry and satellite and aerial technology is booming. And so there's a shot between one of us that actually, if you reach out, you, we could actually potentially help with that investigation. Right. Great. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, did you have something else to, to share? So here's my thought process. I'm not asking you uh, or Chris to all of a sudden become cops, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, and a cop who is also a recovery manager, that might be a very dangerous combination, quite frankly. But the first thing that's going to be going through my mind is, is this a single attack or is it the first of a series of attacks? Is it a campaign? And that's a particular kind of uh, way of thinking when you are undertaking really both response but even ultimately recovery there's no there's no uh, uh, reason to believe that an attack can occur a uh, secondary attack weeks after the first one right that mm -hmm. gets back to Chris's comment about continued profession uh, uh, prevention and heightened security mm -hmm. How, I mean is that is that a kind of interesting or foreign concept? to you when you're sitting across from me at the recovery table and I'm asking the question, what's next? Yeah. Can GIS help with that process? And you know, it's interesting. It actually, it piggybacks on a point that you made earlier um, about predictive analytics. And so if you have this occur, this, again, I've, I've used this in my professional career. But if you have a series of events, and now typically it's probably more than one, but you can start to actually map the environment or you can actually map the conditions in which a nefarious character, a bad person would choose a bad, to do a bad thing. And so one of the ways GIS plays a pivotal role in predictive an analytics of bad characters and you know bad activities is actually understanding the conditions around 
the activity was chosen. And so if, if somebody chose, you know, to blow up a tanker truck, what were the conditions that they chose to do it in? And then look for similar conditions as to where they might choose to do it next if they had launched a campaign. Great. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a bit of a, a follow on that I'll pose to both of you and, and just jump on, uh, jump on in. Um, in. In thinking about uh, how to integrate GIS uh, into this overall process, it's a very, very deep and comprehensive process of mm -hmm. identifying recovery requirement. Obviously you have the, the, the technical capabilities GIS provides and that your aerial mapping systems provide, but jurisdictions also have probably immense stores of data that are specific, you know, uh, uh, demographics, uh, you know, capacities in hospitals, you know, probably a, a fair amount of the economic and supply line data. Mm -hmm. if, if, if we pose the question in the recovery planning process, help us, you know, strategize alternatives and provide, and here's data, uh, is GIS adaptable to, you know, take data that you may not have, you know, the demographics and other data, and draw from that uh, a, uh, a map strategies uh, analysis? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll let you yeah you're still on, so yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, in terms of gaps, I mean, if you if you receive GIS data that has informational gaps, you know, you can always actually work to close that gaps. So like Paul made the comment earlier about crowdsourcing. When I have a gap in an understanding, so let's just say my GIS, my geospatial data is antiquated or not antiquated, but it's it's um not. It's um, old, <laughs> and so if my GIS data is a few years behind the times, what I can actually use the crowdsource to curate it and the crowd to curate it and get it up to speed. And you know, obviously, not every local population has you know a crowd, but there are platforms and there's technology out there. If you just Google it, um, there are companies out there today that will help you to actually supplement the data that you're missing in your existing GIS data. Um, and so they would actually launch campaigns from the cloud, either from mobile devices or from actual platforms on, on laptops like I'm looking at now where they use the, the population of the country um, to actually map um, the situation on the ground. Yeah. And so that, those can easily fill some of those gaps so that you can get the accurate, you know, the best data out of your modeling. Yeah, great. Um, Chris, your your thoughts on that? I, I think that uh, you know again we're talking about gaps. Some, uh, pa Paul mentioned you know for example these macro systems like the the CDC has a vulnerability index, but the city of Seattle probably has as I know they have uh, rich data about you know the specific locations, the the vulnerabilities, things like that. I mean that that process of integration. Um, how do you how do you view that and uh, and I, I am assuming that you have to basically be at the table to know what those gaps are. So, what are your thoughts, Chris? It, and that's correct. I mean, we look a lot at we, we look at a lot of partnerships with these communities. Um, they understand what's how that community is moving and how the population is moving throughout their community, what their community needs are. So, we rely heavily uh, on on a community emergency management uh, agency to be able to help us know what resources we need to bring to help them. Um, you know, we're, we're moving through 23 states and all the counties that we move through and all the cities that we move through. It's very difficult for us to track populations and track issues that they have within those populations. So, you know, when we have an incident, we're going to rely heavily on that emergency management agency. And, and we would recommend and, and highly recommend, you know, county, city, and state agencies to reach out to the industry partners in order to have those conversations well before they have an incident so that we can understand what their needs are. Every community seems to have a different need. It's, it's absolutely amazing. There's no two communities that have the exact same need. So it becomes very critical to build those partnerships well before 
we, we, we have an incident. So that, that's my recommendation with, with industry and communities, just always developing that constant open means of communication and partnership. Mm. There's a huge uh, expected uh, aspect of uh, every disaster. And I think, you know, an intentional uh, act certainly uh, may even increase this. And that's community anxiety, fear, you know, despair, uh, uh, you know, psychological challenges. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if just the description of what we can do, you know, with, with the, the technology of GIS, as well as just the general approach that emergency uh, uh, management takes to try and restore communities, uh, it strikes me that that's awfully potentially helpful. I mean, would would you, you know, kind of be part of a vocal uh, uh, group in these processes to say, let's get this information in front of people of what we can do, what we will do, when when a community is hurting, what uh, it is that uh, the dedicated people, you know, around that table, which I'm still arguing very strongly should include our GIS uh, partners. Um, you know, let's show what it is uh, that we are doing to restore them to the life that they recognized before uh, the, the crisis occurred. Amanda, you're, this is kind of a philosophical question, I guess. <laughs> it is, um, but you know, it, yeah, I just thinking about that aspect of just the fear and concern of the community, it just, it hits hope close to home right now, just because I live in Arvada, Colorado. And um, one of the things that runs through my mind all the time, just living in a state, honestly, that's been through three, you know, um, three mass shootings, to be honest, over the past couple of years, is how, how are our police departments, how are our public safety departments preparing, you know, for the risk of what could happen next? And GIS, just to your point, is so critical to be at that table. And it's GIS in terms of the foundational geospatial data to understand your infrastructure, but it's also understanding, you know, actually mapping out. And it's a bit of, just like you said, a battle plan and understanding, you know, how am I gonna enter this facility? You know, heaven forbid, you know, it's a school, a grocery store, a church, you know, a mall, whatever it is, what are my ingress and egress routes? How am I gonna get the people out of there? And how am I going to make the public aware that we are ready for this situation and we have trained for this situation and that we have we have done, you know, proper, um, I guess, proper disaster planning and rehearsal so that when this happens, we know the time that we're we know the time it's going to take to get the right people in place. And we know the amount of time it's going to take to get the people, you know, as many people as possible um, to safety. Yeah, great. Chris, you've talked a lot about community. I think you're a champion for uh, community engagement as a part of this overall process. So uh, communities often hurt for years after a disaster. I mean, what, what can we do to help, you know, at least show everybody we're doing, uh, you know, everything we can and, and even maybe a little bit more um, in, in the recovery effort? Absolutely. You know, it, and it, we've seen this with, with crude oil trains, unit trains, especially you know coming from the west going to the east on particular routes, and and you know through certain states that are a little bit more vocal than other states about you know particular products that we move uh, through their communities. And one of the things that we've been able to do that, and that we champion is constant communication with the government agencies and the public, and showing that showing the public that we are a partner. And, and moving this product, not just, you know, it's not just a corporate thing that we're doing that, you know, by law, we have to be able to move these products, but there's a partnership here. And this is where GIS really comes into play to be able to show the true picture of the capabilities of their local community and the industry being able to handle a response if need be. Um, just, just having those open dialogue conversations with the communities is absolutely critical to allowing those communities, those citizens, have full confidence in their emergency management folks. 
You know, it's not just not about that industry. It's about the people that actually live in that community. And one of the things that I, I like to talk about with these communities when we're having these conversations is, you know, our employees live in your community. They want to make sure that they're moving these products through your community because that's their community and they're doing it safely. And we want to make sure that we're always prepared and ready to assist whenever there's an incident and try to mitigate all issues and problems when prior to the incident. And by using GIS technology, being able to do trending of you know, different things that may happen on the train or on the track and in that territory, but then also being able to use GIS to be able to help that community be able to identify all the sensitive receptors. Yeah, and yeah. You know, feeding that information constantly between the two entities, but having that open dialogue in front of the citizens of the community is absolutely critical for them to feel comfortable that mm -hmm. yes, if there is an incident, these folks are going to come in, they're going to handle it. And they're going to handle it the right way. And that's a key term, handling it the right way. Um, because at the end of the day, Clark, you, you, say, you say exactly right when you say we want to return this particular area better than we want to store better than it was when we, when we found it. And that's always been our goal. And that goes all the way to you know, the soil, the water. But more importantly, it also goes to the citizens in that in that um, community. I, I, for one, am always um, I listen very closely when in having the conversation, say, with uh, the media or with the community about what we're doing when science is introduced, when technical capabilities are introduced and, and uh, described. Um, good intentions are the, the coin of the realm. But knowing that there are all these other capabilities that we are rigorous, rigorously applying, um, to me, one of the, the great uh, uh, objectives is of our partnership with GIS is the further integration of incident command uh, and, and uh, GIS. Uh, we have the disaster, but we also have the understanding of how the disaster is being responded to and recovered from. Uh, and I think that creates a, an immense set of opportunities. And I can't tell you how many times uh, working with my wonderful GIS team in, in Seattle, uh, where I would just bring a challenge and uh, they would say, well, we can do this. Have you thought about that? Uh, here's additional capabilities we can bring. Uh, uh, you know, very, very, uh, very few times in my career have I had that level of um, just stunningly uh, helpful, insightful, and productive partnership. Well, we reached a point where, unfortunately, we have to wrap up. If I could uh, get uh, from you, uh, my fine friends and, and experts, some concluding comments. Uh, start with Amanda. Sure. So I guess this, just going back to this concept of the integration of GIS for the recovery effort, if there's one thing that I could, um, I guess, leave with you guys is just, you know, to, to take this opportunity to um, take what you've learned actually from this seminar and from our previous talks and start to employ it in your local communities, gain a better understanding of the GIS resources, both in what we call the vector format, the, GI, the information about the infrastructure format, as well as the imaging resources that you have available. Because having this capability and this, this capability, really the strategy that comes from this capability at your fingertips is gonna make your city more resilient. And it's also gonna, as you, you know, essentially form that strategy as an act of resiliency. <laughs> you heard when you get to that point, and hopefully you never do, where you have to go through the recovery effort. But when you do, it's going to work in a much more fluid, efficient, and humanitarian way. And so I would Great. just implore you to learn as much as you can. And um, you know, always feel free to reach out to experts and to folks that have been doing this for some time. And I know every one of us would be happy to hop on a line and help you better understand what resources you have and how to use it towards that effective recovery strategy. Great, very, very well said. Thank you, Amanda. Chris? Yeah, you know, my main thing is build the relationships, build the partnerships. You know, it's, you know, to have those resources via the partnerships and relationships that you make, not only just in the government agencies, but the private sector can be critical 
to reducing the amount of time it takes to recover during an incident. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, part of that is pre-planning. Part of that is just having simple conversations you know, not one person, not one group can do everything. And it takes, it definitely takes a team of experts to be able to bring in ideas, bring in recommendations, but also bring in the tools and the data that's needed in order to bring an incident to a conclusion and, and bring not only just to a conclusion, but bring it to a successful conclusion. So that when you move on to the next incident, because there's always a next one, you make that response and that recovery even better, easier, and more efficient. <laughs> well, I sincerely want to thank uh, Chris and Amanda and, uh, and the participation of Paul in this roundtable. Uh, I learned a lot, uh, and uh, I, I'm always uh, grateful when I have a chance to spend time with people who really know what they're talking about. Uh, as a former, again, police chief and recovery manager and several other hats that uh, some of which I didn't seek out. Uh, I'm only as uh, good as the smart people around me. And uh, I think we talked about some very important issues today. Uh, on behalf of uh, the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation, I'm a board member. Uh, and uh, my other role as a facilitator and subject matter expert for the Center for Homeland Defense and Security uh, at the Naval Postgraduate School. I want to thank all of you for, for listening to this presentation. Hopefully it was a benefit to you. Uh, as, uh, as my mom always told me, the gold standard for any human endeavor is to leave the place better than the way you found it. And I think that's our guiding mantra here. Uh, so thanks again. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, we have many resources that we could turn your way. Uh, we also have some uh, excellent uh, links and other uh, program uh, elements that you can access via this presentation's uh, website, as well as other NAPSIC resources. Thanks again, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.